<laughs> okay, so I guess I'll start off with some introductions. We have Graham Hayes. He is a software engineer on the HP Cloud DNS team and one of the designate core reviewers. We have myself, Kyle McInnes. I'm the designate PTL and the tech lead of the HP Cloud DNS team. And we have Tim Simmons from Rackspace, software engineer on their cloud DNS team. So what we're going to talk about today, we have Overview of Designate, quick intro to what we do, quick intro to the APIs, client libraries, and so on, um, how we integrate with the DNS servers, so how, you know, how we talk to Bind, how we talk to all of the other guys, and a little bit of our current integration with Nova and Neutron, which is called Designate Sync. We do have some plans for some more advanced stuff. We've got some working sessions with Nova and Neutron tomorrow, so um, keep an eye on that space. So first up, what is Designate? Designate is an OpenStack-style REST API for managing DNS. So architecturally, we're very, very similar to Nova Neutron, sorry, to Nova and Trove and so on, in that we, we aren't a DNS server. We instead orchestrate and manage the DNS server. So if you want to use Bind, perfect. If you want to use Akamai, perfect. So we have two different models. Um, On-premise, that would be using like Bind or PowerDNS. You run the DNS servers yourself. You have the whole infrastructure under your control. The other model is where you integrate with a third party. So we currently support Akamai and Dynect. Um, so they'll run your front-end infrastructure that the query customers actually query, but you'll manage the control plane. So why would you use Designate? As I think everybody knows, DNS is not cool. Um, it is absolutely not the coolest thing you're going to have. It doesn't have Docker in the name. It doesn't have Neutron in the name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's plumbing. You know, it's, everybody has something there today that, that mostly works. Every company, every cloud has something there. But you know, as people are starting to move towards cloud and they're able to turn around and go, Nova Boot, why are we filing support tickets with the IT department to actually have the DNS provisioned? So we should start giving users the full control to go end to end. Um, so, yeah, that's why. <laughs> so I am going to hand over to Graham um, and let him talk a little bit about the API and client libraries. Okay, so we have three real ways you can interact with Designate at the moment. We have a REST API you can query directly. We have a command line client that does all the major features, the, the basic stuff that users need to do with DNS right now. And there's, we have a new OpenStack, OpenStack client compatible command line client being developed at the moment. <clears throat> and then we also, we also have Python bindings, which allow you to, whatever you can think of doing and you want to do it programmatically, our, our bindings give you full control over a, 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 the, your entire zone and all your records and record sets. Um, as part of the, the command line and the Python bindings obviously interact directly with the REST API. But and with that, we have currently have three APIs we have available. As of Kilo being released, we have now deprecated our V1 API. Um, and we've moved on to V2, which is the latest and greatest uh, API we have. It has a lot of nice features. It allows you to have zones that are created by one tenant, transfer the ownership to somebody else. So say you're. Uh, one team is looking after a particular d domain and they're transferring ownership to somebody else. There's a very nice way to do that in the API just, uh, and just transfer the ownership directly over. We also have an admin API, which has generic admin tools, things like you can look up the amount of usage for a tenant, so how many zones a tenant has, how many records they have, um, and what the quotas are, that are set for each tenant. And you can also set the quotas for each tenant from that API. The V2 and the admin APIs also support plugins. Uh, they're based off Pecan. So if you can write a Pecan controller, you can load it into the API uh, when, you, when you start up the API service. So this allows you to take the power, to take what Designate can do internally and also expose it in whatever particular way that you might have internally uh, to your end users. So I'm just going to show you, this is for the V2 API. This is a basic how to create a domain. So you just post with two simple key values. I, I, obviously, if you're using uh, Keystone authentication, you'd have an author authorization header at the top. But this is just a basic no auth example. And this will return your zone. And you'll notice that 
everything in the V2 API is now asynchronous. So you'll get a response immediately with a status of pending. And uh, Tim will be going through in a minute how the status will progress from pending to active. So it's, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice, fairly basic object. Um, and also, as part of the V2 API, we decided that we didn't like just giving generic error. We were going to give slightly more feedback about what you did wrong. So can anyone see the problem with that request? Yeah. You notice 1,000, that's not a valid IPv4 address. So if you send that into our API, you get back this. And it'll, it actually gives you the full path of where you went wrong, what went wrong, and what, valid, what, what it was validating at the time. So I, this, will, this will obviously make, when we start integrating it into Horizon properly, a proper, proper feedback loop, or even programmatically, you can look through the path of what the message is and the error type to really understand what went wrong. Um, and this is, this is available on all the resources in the V2 API uh, right now. So Tim is now going to show you how we go from the pending status to active. Hey. So just a quick little audience participation. How many of you this morning got out of bed absolutely psyched that you were going to hear about DNS today? <laughs> OK. It's a lot of people. You're all lying. I know you're all lying. <laughs> that's, that's not going to happen. So like Kyle said, DNS is not something that a lot of people get super amped up about, except apparently in this room full of nerds. Um, but kind of contrary to that, there's a lot of different ways that you can run DNS. It's probably because it's been around for such a long time. Um, all of the things you see in a beautiful word, word cloud here are ways that you should be or definitely can um, run designate. This is important because every single person who comes into our IRC room or, or contacts us, comes up after the talk, is going to say, hey, can I run it this way? Can I do it with this DNS server? Can I do it with this configuration? Um, and a lot of the, I think a lot of the reason that happens is because somebody has always got some old legacy system that they want to integrate with, and it's DNS. Nobody wants to change that. That's, that's like that's super boring. No, no product manager is like, yeah, let's go. Like, we got to update that DNS server. Um, <laughs> So given that, designate needs to be a few things when it comes to talking to DNS servers. It needs to be flexible, so we can talk to all those that I showed. It needs to be scalable, because I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever had a DNS outage, uh, a lot of people come and bang down your door, and it's not a pleasant time. And it needs to be simple, because nobody wants to deal with complicated setups um, for something that should just work. So the way that designate does these things um, is down to a few of the components that exist in Designate. So first I want to talk about flexibility. If you're going to talk to all of the different DNS servers that exist in some way or another, you need to speak a similar language. And DNS has been around for such a long time, and it was architected so well, that there's a universal protocol for updating and transferring zone data between two DNS servers. Um, and I want to describe that briefly. Please don't fall asleep. It's going to get more exciting. Um, notify is when you are going, you as a DNS server say, hey, slave, or hey, friend, I've got an update to this zone. If you'd like, you should probably come and try and get it. That slave or that other friend, master, whatever, is going to try and perform an AXFR, which is a full zone transfer. So it's going to zip the, the master is going to zip the, File, or the zone file up into DNS wire format and send it along, and then the slave can do with it what it pleases. So the designate component that does most of this legwork is called MiniDNS. It's a very, very minimal DNS server that we wrote that's specifically targeted for these DNS protocol things. That sounds a little crazy, but we try to keep it very small, very simple, and it gives us full control which is really, really great. Um, we can do things with that, um, like configuring the, the frequency that we send those, those messages, configuring timeouts, configuring retries, and you know, if there's some error or some unfortunate thing that comes up during the process, we can go and, we can go and actually fix it. And designate as a whole acts as the master for your, for your zones, and that, that's the source of truth for you. 
And if you think about it like that, mini DNS or some cluster of scalable, horizontally scalable mini DNS nodes is going to be your DNS master. So that's going to be actually where those slaves come and transfer um, zone data from. And I say it acts as a master, there, are, uh, there is a specific use case where designate doesn't have to be the master, and uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. So most of what I just talked about there is a lot of what you'll be doing. Um, DNS zones don't get created and deleted too, too often, um, and the, they're mostly updated uh, because people don't want their zones going away on DNS servers for any period of time. So updating is pretty easy. You know, you, for almost all DNS servers, they support that universal protocol, and everybody's happy. Creating and deleting can be a little different, though. Um, some, some DNS servers are backed by a database. So when you want to create a zone, you need to create a row and a table. Some have very specific protocols, like Bind, which uses RNDC to add and delete zones. So you've got to integrate with that. Some newer, fancier DNS servers have REST APIs that you can go and use. Um, and some have other services that you're going to go and call some other API out to. So trying to do that universally is not particularly possible. So as part of our pool manager, um, which is a mechanism for keep, or it's a service that deals with the proliferation of DNS data from designate to whatever DNS servers that you need to manage and helps keep them in sync to make sure that they're going well, it has a customizable plugin infrastructure so that you can choose and use whatever creating and deleting mechanism you need for the DNS backend that you choose. So like I said, for bind, you're gonna call RNDC, blah, blah, blah. For, for power DNS, you're gonna be adding rows to a table in a database. Um, and that's really nice because you know, there, there are all sorts of configurations even within like, okay, I just wanna use bind. It's like, okay, well, which way do you wanna run it? And depending on those, it's gonna be different um, which kind of pool manager you use. Um, which kind of pool manager backend you use. And if you have some wonky thing that you need to integrate with, um, this is a great place to do it because you know, the stock ones work great, but there's no reason you can't write a custom one. For people who need even more control and they don't wanna do a zone transfer directly to a DNS server, um, we have the agent. So this is a very small Python daemon that runs on or near to the DNS server and talks directly with MiniDNS. So it kind of implements the other side of the DNS protocol that MiniDNS is spitting out. This is really great in situations where you need total and complete control. Um, you know, if, if you're running huge bind and you, know, you don't wanna run bind as a master and a slave at the same time, you can run the agent on that bind server, let it talk to designate and do all of the great things that designate does, and bind doesn't even know that there's not you know, some poor engineer sitting there hacking out those zone files and, and creating commands. Um, <coughs> you know, other situations might be where a DNS server doesn't support zone transfers, or maybe down the line, incremental zone transfers for some reason. You can just lay the agent on top of that, and mini DNS knows no different that it's not, you know, bind or power DNS down there. And you can integrate in whatever way that you want um, with the DNS server. Um, what someone did recently is they used the Netflix uh, client called Denominator, and they integrated that as an agent backend so that um, literally you can call designate um, and then your designate can call another designate, so you designate while you designate. Uh, so thanks to that guy, I guess. Um, the one situation where designate doesn't have to be a master is called secondary zones. So you can set up um, at your company or your whatever um, a DNS server that you own and you manage, but it's probably unwise for you to try and run that as a highly available server for um, the entire world to consume. Um, you're gonna get DDoSed for some reason, you're gonna piss off somebody and, and it's gonna be a bad, bad time. So what you can do is keep your cards close to the chest and tell Designate, hey, I want you to add a secondary zone with my special Snowflake DNS server as your master. And it, Designate will go and do the zone transfer from that server and then fan it out to whatever DNS servers it manages. So you don't, if, you know, if for some reason you don't want to use Designate's great API or client, you can do that. Um, and this, is, this is really great for you know, a lot of other use cases. 
So uh, Kyle's going to tell you about Nova and Neutron. Okay, so in Designate, we have a service called Sync. The Designate Sync service is uh, an event listener. It sits there listening to RabbitMQ for messages. The messages are what Nova and Neutron and other services can emit. So for example, attaching a floating IP, uh, booting a VM. Mm. I thought there was a different slide after this. Uh, attaching a, a floating IP, you'll get an event. Um, if you boot a server, delete a server, you'll get events. And you're able to then take that information and run it through a, a plugin, a plugin of your choosing. It will then turn around, look at the information in the event. That might be the host name, the tenant it's in, it might be the flavor, it might be you know, all of that kind of information is available. And turn it into a series of actions against your DNS environment. So maybe it's add a new record, maybe it's delete an old record, maybe it's add you know, a, another A record because you booted a new load balancer. Um, so it kind of sits on the outside of Designate where we have the sync service listening to Nova and Neutron through RabbitMQ. And it then simply talks to our core service called Central. So it looks just like API calls coming in. It looks just like um, anything else you might be doing. So it has the full power that anything you could have done in the API, <coughs> you can write this tiny little plugin. We include two samples out of the box. They are the Nova fixed, Nova fixed and Neutron floating IP handlers. They're samples. They're really basic because every single person in the world has turned around and said, we want something different. We don't want host, uh, you know, name of the VM dot my domain. We want something else. And we decided, OK, make it pluggable. The Nova fixed one is, I think, eight lines of code. The Neutron floating IP one is, I think, about 20 lines of code. So it's tiny. You're not writing. It's, this isn't a three-week exercise to go build and write one of these things, at least not for simple use cases. So you know, it's there. You have to, if you want to use this, you're going to end up writing a small plugin for that. There's a sample in the contrib folder. It's an entire Python package. You pull it out into its own Git repo, and it will install as a plugin natively alongside. So there's some samples there for you. Um, and I guess we're going to go to questions. Uh, this went through very, very quickly. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, actually, timing these things is always very, very difficult. So do we have any questions? Yeah, if you use the microphones, the, there's one there, just so that it's caught so on one. video. Hey, guys. So my name is Joe McBride. I work a little bit with these guys, too. And I'm just curious for the audience, who here is running Designate in production? Just raise your hand. Don't Nobody in the room okay. yet. <laughs> who is evaluating it to run in a dev or production environment? That's a lot of hands. That's, cool. That's 40, good. maybe. OK. Um, for you guys, I got stickers. So come on. <laughs> <laughs> They're designate stickers. And by the time you go to production, you should be having these on your laptop. <laughs> OK. I have, in fact, two questions, if you don't mind. Um, the um, first is about um, the records that are handled by uh, designate. And you said that, uh, indeed, DNS is not some kind of fancy stuff. And uh, there is no in technologies. But there are still records that are still new. For example, I'm thinking of TLSA and the SSH fingerprinting. I see a great use case of using uh, SSH fingerprint in the yeah. DNS. Um, so I would like to know, that's my first question, if it's supported. Okay, so we don't support TLSA. We just haven't gotten around to doing it. We do support SSH fingerprints. Um, I see exactly the same use case as you. Uh, but to make that really viable, we need to, to make it worthwhile to do that. We really need to get DNSSEC in place so that you can actually trust the, the chain and the fingerprint you get. And you never have to say yes when you SSH into that new server again if we get all of this right. Yeah, and that was my second question about DNSSEC support. Because you said that, and I don't know how agents are working, because it was just clearly explained, uh, shortly explained. But basically, if you have AX affair and you don't do D uh, DNSSEC in designate, you will just get the, um, uh, uh, I would say, a zone file, which has no DNSSEC records after that. So if you send it, for example, to bind or poor DNS or whatever, it will still be unsigned. So. Uh, for us, it's completely important to have uh, DNSSEC. So how, could it, how is it possible to make it work? Okay, so there's probably a couple of ways you can do it. So 
The easiest to explain one is the likes of the Akamai backend, where Akamai will zone transfer from us, and they will sign the zone and publish it on their network of millions of DNS servers. So that's the trivial way. You can then take that idea and apply it, if you're trying to do this today rather than when we get it fully implemented. You can then take that same idea and the agent backend, the agent service mm -hmm. is, it effectively gets a copy of the zone and you can then do what you like with it. So you could run it through the uh, binds DNSSEC tools to have it signed there and then. Um, you could do that with all of the backends. Um, longer term, we're planning to get DNSSEC built right in so when the zone transfer happens from mini DNS, it will get signed at that point, or possibly pre-signed a little bit earlier, and pushed out. So the, the whole zone should be signed at that point. Okay, I so have a last question then sure. about the, you said that the agent receives raw data from the, from the zone. Is it um, specific on the um, backend that will arrive later? Uh, I mean, for example, bind as uh, uh, dollar generate things yep. that doesn't work okay. in uh, NSD, for example. So what you'll get in, in the agent is um, you won't get like a zone file. You will get, uh, if you're familiar with the DNS Python library, you will get a DNS Python zone object. You can then do what you like with that. So you might call the two text method on it, which will render a, a bind zone file. Or if you need to do something like, let's say you need to put it all into ParaDNS into the database, you might iterate the, over all of them and insert them into the database. So you have a bit of flexibility there in what you do. Um, does that kind of, so does that answer the question? Exactly, thank okay. you. You, no should, you should definitely come to our um, fishbowl session at 520, I think it is. Oh, yeah. The use case discussion? Yeah, yeah I want to, before we forget, um, we have a fishbowl session at 520 where we want to try and get feedback from users on what they actually want, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and so on. So please come. Um, Do you remember the room number? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put my phone away before this. You Joe, know? do you want to look it up? <laughs> Okay, right. Joe, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll shout it out in a minute. We'll tell you what it is. 306. 306. 306. Thank you, Joe. Hello, my name is Tom. I used to work for one of those DNS companies on your slide, and now I work for Rackspace. I've been sent from the future to tell you of your impending doom. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Just kidding. You guys always like to hear about our doom. Uh, so I have a couple questions. Um, what types of records do you attempt to validate? And how do you validate those? Uh, okay, so records, we, we, we valid, any record we support, we will validate. Um, we have a, for every record type, we have either regexes or uh, we break them up into the component parts. So for an SSH fingerprint, for example, we break out the type and the encryption type and the actual fingerprint into separate objects, separate, uh, variables and then we do validation on those. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty in-depth the way we do validation. Yeah. For, the, for the most part, we, we try and make sure that everything that comes in through our API is 100% valid, even if there are cases where some DNS servers would accept it, because we deal with bind, power DNS, Akamai, Dynect, and when one of these, when one of those services doesn't support, you know, uh, I can't think of a good example right now, um, some of them will blow up if you put a C name next to uh, an, you know, an NS record. Um, it's totally invalid to do that, but some will actually serve that. Yeah. Others won't. So we generally pick the strictest set of things and validate that. Okay, cool. Um, my, other, uh, my other question is, and I th think I heard you mention it, uh, support for XFERS instead of AXFERS. Is that coming? Is that support something you're interested for which one? Uh, IX. IXFR. So we haven't got that implemented yet. Uh, there's a spec up at the moment. We're still trying to get, figure out how we're going to track all of that state in a scalable way. Um, but that is on the, that is on the cards, uh, where MiniDNS will do an IFXR if requested instead of a full zone transfer. Obviously, when you start getting to 500,000 record zones, doing a full zone transfer, it's, it's slow. Uh, yeah. 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 Also, the, the note you had about um, zone create and delete. Um, there are, there is absolutely a cloud provider here who unaccidentally dropped 50,000 zones on a provider and pushing 50,000 zones to the edge on any provider is painful. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so just be, just be cognizant of that if you're 
if you're attempting to do what looks amazing, by the way, yeah. um, just be careful what you try to push. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, we've, at, at HP Cloud, we've been running it in production for three years now at this point, uh, two years maybe at this point. So we know it works. Hi, um, is there any support for creating pointer records alongside a record? Yes, so you absolutely can create pointer records. So obviously pointers are a little bit weird in that uh, two tenants of your cloud might have IPs next to each other, but they actually live in the same reverse DNS zone. You can't really divvy those up into anything smaller than a slash 24, not without a lot of cheating. So we have a, an, a second API, uh, an API endpoint in the V2 API for handling reverse DNS specifically. Okay. Um, and it will handle your floating IP space and so on. It will show them the list of their floating IPs, and you can just go, I want, I want this pointer on it. And behind the scenes, it will shove all of that into a shared zone so that customers can't see or touch each other's pointer records. I had a, I had a question that uh, kind of talks uh, about the, the PTR records. Uh, I asked uh, Kyle, the PTL for Neutron, there's like host names are a good example of something that's really at the boundary of, you know, designate Neutron and Nova all kind of fight for, like, who controls the host name. If you get it through the metadata server of CloudInit, it's Nova. If you get it from DHCP, it's Neutron. Um, is there any way that, uh, and, you know, are, are you, along with that, or is, are y'all uh, gonna stick on just the authoritative side? Uh, you know, how so do you see all these things kind of evolving together? So we have a work session with Nova and Neutron tomorrow about much tighter integration. Um, effectively, you know, today you're right, you type in a name, it goes into Nova, it might be totally invalid, it's not a DNS name, it has spaces, it has special characters, it has all of that fun. Um, sadly, there's not much we can do there without breaking the Nova API. So we do have to figure out some way of providing that information through to Neutron. Neutron then turning around, creating the port, talking to its DNS mask, putting the right stuff in there, and then if you've registered a particular network or subnet and saying, this isn't a, I, want this, I want my servers in this to have public names, here's the designate domain ID for it, have them call out to us. So that's kind of the, the direction we're going at the moment. Um, tomorrow is when we're hoping to figure out some of the smaller details though. So I don't have a great answer on who will own the name. I have a question about um, how you get messages from Neutron um, and uh, Nova. Yep. And I, I'm assuming that's RabbitMQ or Message Bus. Yep. Messages, are those queues as messages created for Designate, or are you just relying on the generic uh, messages coming from Nova and Neutron? All right, so we get the generic messages. So it's the exact same stuff that Celiometer listens in on. So if you configure Nova and Neutron just right, um, you don't really need that slide, do we? Um, <laughs> If you configure Nova and Neutron just right, they'll emit the notification twice, once for Celiometer and once for us. Um, and that allows us to consume it. So you get all the Nova and Neutron messages? If anything any service emits uh, into Rabbit, we can, we can pull in. Um, the plugins are what actually, you effectively get the raw payload into the plugin and you can do what you like with the content of it. All right, thanks. Hi, um, you described earlier that Designate could actually act as a secondary with a, an additional primary upstream. Yep. Could you describe a use case for that? So a big use case for that is probably public cloud and enterprise not wanting to hand out, um, the, the, not wanting to get rid of their internal authoritative DNS server, but they want to make use of the public cloud's mix of DNS servers. So you know, an enterprise doesn't want to stand up 200 DNS servers around the world to get everything nice and fast, but the cloud providers and the DNS providers absolutely do, they have that. Um, so that's, I think, the primary use case for that. Well, there is, it does also open up a theoretical possibility where you could run designate internally and have a designate driver for designate that run, that, so that, that uses, say, HP's or Rackspace's designate install as the place where all your DNS data goes. Okay, yeah. Take so, the hybrid so, cloud buzzword yeah. right there. Private cloud, federating the DNS stuff out to the public clouds. So, so in that in that model, you really wouldn't be able to inject additional records via designate. It would really just be acting as a pass through. Yeah, it, it, it acts as a pass through. But the API will actually, if it, if you try to do a record update in a secondary zone via the API, it'll give you a, it'll give you a forbidden error. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other last questions? 
Okay, thank you guys. Uh, and 303? 306. 306. 306. 306, if you want to come tell us what we need to do next. <laughs>